myself, uh, I'm Arum Lajit. I'm the senior product specialist for the uh, Secure Envoy, uh, the complete portfolio from Bulwark Technologies. And uh, along with me, uh, there is a gentleman from um, Secure Envoy, Mr. Ben, who is actually the pre-sales consultant for the Secure Envoy and Secure Identity DLP. Today, just uh, we want to just give a presentation and a webinar going to conduct on the uh, Secure Identity DLP that will title with the everything you want to know about the data protection, but uh, always uh, beware after it was. And also, uh, we will give a clear cut idea about how then, uh, you know, the sensitive data will be controlled and how we can give a protection on your sensitive data. So we will run through our different uh, valuable points on that uh, particular area. And uh, in between, if you have any kind of clarifications, uh, you have any kind of queries, uh, you can just uh, put on a chat and you can just send to all the panelists. Uh, we will be answerable and we will share our uh, you know, comments and response into that. So uh, before moving into uh, you know, webinar in detail, we'll have a small uh, uh, webinar housekeeping session that we are putting forward. Actually, all uh, attendees will be in a silent mode. Or you can just, uh, I just already mentioned, you can just share your uh, you know, uh, queries and doubt in the chat session and send to the all panelists. And also we have a dedicated you know, uh, Q&A session at the end of the, uh, you know, uh, the webinar or the presentation. And uh, this webinar will be completely recorded and uh, we will send the recording version of uh, this particular webinar that you can always review in the future. Uh, if some of uh, our valuable, uh, you know, attendee who, who could be able to join uh, today's session at a particular time. So you can always review that and you can also, uh, uh, you know, clarify and you can just, you know, recheck with the points which uh, Ben is going to present today. And uh, today's uh, webinar agenda will be we will giving an introduction about the walk, and also we'll giving a complete introduction about the and why. And uh, uh, then Ben will jump on to the why do we need uh, data protection for your sensitive data, and also he will cover uh, seven steps into the data protection, and uh, not only just a DLP solution. What are things they exactly cover uh, into the data protection? He will give a clear cut idea. And also, he will uh, give uh, a, you know light about the DLP myths uh, that you will always uh, face in your you know, corporate and enterprise world. So, moving into the you know Bulwark interaction, Bulwark is actually a cybersecurity specialized value-added distributor in the information security solutions, and uh, we are representing almost uh, 20 second years in in uh, Middle East and in India for the last four years. And our company was established in 1999 in the Middle East, and our Indian, uh, you know, the branch was open in uh, 2017. In the overall and the complete uh, information information security solution portfolio, we are representing around 24 different, uh, I mean, 24 plus different technology vendors, and we have around uh, 700 plus uh, business partners across uh, both Middle East and India. And uh, we have actually an established an excellent track record in the delivering the world class uh, uh, cybersecurity product and excellent customer service in throughout this complete period. And also, we have the partners with the best of breed technology vendors. And uh, we offering an award winning products with excellent customer service for the last uh, 22 plus years. And we deliver the round the cloak a value added service through our partner community across the Middle East and also uh, the KSA and Indian subcontinent regions. Also, we uh, will work, uh, work as an extended arm for our security vendor. So we will be one of our the strong uh, security uh, I mean extended arm for the secure envoy because secure envoy is one of our strong security vendor. And uh, we are representing the complete Middle East and the uh, you know the Indian subcontinent regions and selling their IT products through uh, our, uh, you know, research channel uh, partners of, uh, you know, channel. And we have over the dedicated uh, sales, marketing, and certified technical, you know, engineers for all the technology vendors, and also especially for Secure Envoy, we have a, a dedicated team members for all the portfolio that Secure Envoy is offering to the valuable customers. 
So from here, I'm just handovering to Ben. Uh, over to you, Ben, please. Thanks for that, Aramel. So Secure Envoy, we're a cyber security vendor, traditionally known in the identity and access MFA type space, uh, which we've been doing for 19 plus years and more recently as a data protection cybersecurity vendor as well. We are based in the UK, uh, so we're headquartered in Basingstoke in the UK, but with our partners such as Bulwark, we have a global presence um, with customers around the world, and we focus on our channel relationships. So we sell through and work with our channel partners, and Secure Envoy ourselves, we're also owned by a larger group, so the Shearwater Group PLC, uh, which has a portfolio of cyber security companies under it. So today I'm going to talk about data protection and why we need data protection. It's not going to be a specific DLP pitch. You know, I'm not going to talk specifically around the Secure Envoy DLP solution. However, obviously, everything that I talk about today can be backed up by the Secure Envoy DLP solutions. And that is, you know, further conversations that you can have with Bulwark and ourselves to actually identify where you are in your data protection journey and how we can assist it. So why do we need data protection. Some big reasons that we see, you know, compliance is one of the biggest ones, whether it's a particular compliance standard, such as PCI DSS, HIPAA, SOX, or whether it's around meeting requirements for GDPR, CCPA, relevant, um, you know, local specific versions of data privacy. There are now over uh, 90 countries in the world that have some form of data privacy legislation. So these standards are going to stipulate how businesses should be securing PII data, personally identifiable information, uh, and other sensitive information. And DLP tools are built to address the requirements of these common standards. So understanding why we need it. Other reasons for needing a data protection strategy, uh, things like protecting your intellectual property and your intangible assets. So organizations have trade secrets, other strategic proprietary information uh, or intangible assets. So an intangible asset is something like a, a customer list or a business strategy. And, you know, if you lose any of this type of information, it can be extremely damaging to the business from loss of revenue, um, loss of reputation and fines under the regulations as well. So this type of data is directly being targeted by attackers and also malicious insiders. Having a data protection strategy and data protection policies can help us identify and safeguard our critical information assets. Another reason uh, for needing data protection and a data protection strategy is visibility of our data. Nobody knows where all of their data is. You know, there are vast amounts of data being created every day. So your data protection strategy is going to take that into consideration and it will provide an insight into how stakeholders use data. And in order to protect it, you must know, first of all, it exists, where it exists, who uses it, what purposes it's being used for. And, you know, that's getting more and more difficult with the amount of data that's being generated. Um, so just a stat, so from 2010 to 2020, the amount of data created, captured, copied, and consumed in the world increased from 1.2 trillion gigabytes to 59 trillion gigabytes. So in 10 years, 
um, it went up a massive, massive amount. So 5,000% growth. And it's only going to grow more and more. So, you know, how much data will be being produced over the next decade? So, when we look at, um, you know, types of data breaches, so this is from the egress data breach um, 2021, and 85% of breaches involved a human element. So this isn't, um, you know, computers going wrong. This isn't, um, you know, that type of scenario of sending our data out. This is actually humans being involved. So what types of attacker are targeting our businesses? And the more we understand about the types of attackers targeting our businesses, the better we can protect ourselves and be prepared for these attacks. So human behavior is complex and it can be influenced and manipulated in a range of ways. Um, all humans have fundamental psychological vulnerabilities that can manifest during times of heightened pressure of stress, and this will impact their decision-making process in real time. So what does that actually mean? That means that basically human beings can be hacked. We're talking social engineering. Um, so this could be, the accidental insider persona and this is a person inside your organization being manipulated by an external attacker so this might be a classic phishing attack a good email that's been sent into a particular user and they've been tricked into giving away some login details and that's the foothold that the attacker is looking for within your organization this could also be physical, um, somebody being, um, you know, tailgated into your building and they hold the door open for the attacker. Now the attacker has physical access into your organization and you've got a big problem. But that's accidental, you know, they don't mean to do it. However, we have to think about these things. It could be uh, a malicious insider. So one of your current or potential former employees or a contractor or even a trusted business partner who has authorized access to critical assets in your system and they misuse their access to negatively affect you. So classic scenario is member of staff is leaving and they want to take a list of their contacts and customers with them because they're moving to a new sales organization or a competitor. They're trying to use that information. They want to take your price lists with them. So they're misusing their credentials in order to steal data from you to further their career and their aims in their new organization. <clears throat> Malicious insiders are in some ways harder to detect than an outside attacker. You know, we can monitor our systems. We can see that somebody's attacking us, but a malicious insider has authorized access to our systems. So they can be a lot harder. Uh, and on average, it takes 77 days to identify the actions of a malicious insider. And finally, we have what we typically think about when we say, you know, we're being hacked, we're being attacked, an external hacker or attacker. Um, they are typically technical people um, or organizations, and they're intentionally targeting our technology to create an incident and hopefully, well, hopefully for them, not us, to create a data breach. It may be an individual targeting us, it may be a group, or it may even be a nation state. Um, and it could be happening from, you know, anywhere in the world. So we've got a massive thing that we have to think about is the humans. The next largest, um, you know, breaches involve credentials. And these may have come from the humans in the first place. So, you know, they're stealing of credentials using phishing attacks. And 94% of all businesses that were surveyed in the data breach in the data breach report um, said that they'd suffered a data breach from an insider in the last 12 months. So what sort of information um, could be being stolen and targeted uh, by us? So credentials, 
you know, are one of the most sought after data types and personal data uh, behind that. So credentials, obviously, because they will give attackers access to other parts of our system. Um, personal data, well, what's personal data? Social security numbers, names, addresses, passport details, potentially credit card information, um, lots of things that can be monetized by the attackers. Because ultimately, the attackers are looking to make money. They're not doing this just to cause us pain and suffering. They are doing this because it's their job and it makes them money. So we can see why you know credentials and personal information are going to be a favorite target. And you know they can be resold. So this one shows us uh, the top types of data stolen or, or from a mistake made by an employee. So the most common type of data mistakenly leaked from organizations is personal data. And, you know, if you think maybe somebody sends an email and they put the wrong CC or the wrong two because um, they pick the wrong one from their email list, then we can see why personal information is more likely to be breached in this way. This is the value of the top 12 types of data sold on the dark web in 2019 from Statista. Um, and as you can imagine, banking details, um, you know, debit card details were worth the most when they were sold on the dark web. Uh, and that makes sense because they can obviously be further monetized um, by people buying them. PayPal accounts, credit card accounts, Amazon accounts, all can be used um, to buy goods and services. And then further down, we've got things like driving licenses and passport information and other proof of identity. So, you know, we're looking at you know identity theft at this point as well so details are being traded you know and again the, the the attackers and the hackers are trying to make money out of it so what can we do how can we protect ourselves so i'm going to go through you know what i class as the seven steps to data protection now you know this is what a data protection strategy could look like to an organization but that's not to say that this is the only approach. You know, it's a structured approach and we need to have a structured approach. So we try and make sure that we're not missing anything in the organization. And having that structured approach is key to any data protection strategy. So we're gonna go through these seven areas. So step one is prioritizing the criticality of your data. So not all data is equally critical. So the first step in a data protection program is to identify uh, which data would cause you the biggest issue if it were to be stolen or even damaged or deleted. So, you know, we're gonna have a problem if we lose data, whether it's, you know, actually taken outside of the organization or damaged or deleted. So depending on the types of organization, depends on what you're gonna prioritize. A manufacturing company might choose to prioritize intellectual property, such as their design documents, um, particularly you know, those for future products, things which they haven't actually yet brought out to market. Retailers and financial service companies should obviously rank PCI data and customer data very highly. Uh, healthcare companies would prioritize medical records, PHI type data, and these are often stored on mobile devices. So it may seem obvious, but a data protection strategy should start with your most valuable data or most sensitive data, because that's what's most likely to be targeted. And that's what's most likely gonna cause you harm if it gets lost or stolen. And it's important to engage stakeholders across the business. So a data protection strategy isn't just something for the IT department to implement. It's not just something for the data protection officer to force down onto everybody. We need to engage stakeholders across the business and then and only then can we understand which data types are most important to them uh, and to build the data protection strategy. 
following on from that mapping our data repository so understanding where our data is being stored and therefore we can put precautions in place and protection in place for those data stores this might be traditional on-premise file servers it might be your endpoints uh, these days it's more and more likely to involve some form of cloud storage then we need to classify and categorize our data so we know this is pci data this is pii this is um you know intellectual property data and this can often be seen as a formidable challenge classifying our data types and we have multiple ways we can do that within dlp tooling um, we can classify it based on context so this could be either what's actually included within that data what the data looks like is it pci data is it pii data does it contain names and addresses it could be based on the application that produced it it could be based on where the data is being stored so if we have a nice hierarchy of data stores and we have a folder for all of our confidential projects and we have a folder for hr data we can classify it based on where it's living, or we could look at who created the data in the first place. What role do they have in the organization? Are they in HR? Are they in finance? We can then go further and add classification tags to the data, and then we can track that data using those tags where it's being used in the organization. And we can you know, map those two together um, we can do the inspection of the content and again you know things like pci data social security information they all follow well-defined formats so we can identify that data easily step three on our data protection strategy is understanding our risk profile so this is going to vary with the types of data and where the data is going uh, where the data is being used so traditionally we had all of our data on premise all of our employees were in the office so network-based security controls monitoring the data within the organization um, it's residing inside the firewall and you know we had control over it with today we've got distributed users distributed devices we're sharing data more and more between our own users with third parties, customers, supply chain. And depending on the data and depending on where it's going, we have different risks. So we need to understand those risks and build out our risk profile. Um, and, you know, data is often at its highest risk when it's being used on endpoints, which are, you know, not necessarily within the corporate network and firewall these days and even more so when it's in motion from those endpoints when it's being used when it's being uploaded when it's being copied even when it's being printed or sent via email so data in motion and understanding where the data is being used so that could be you know attaching um, records to an email or copying it to usb device so a robust data protection strategy must account for the mobility of data and the moments when the data is put at risk. In order to help us do that, we need to understand how data is being used, identify the existing behavior that puts data at risk is a critically important stage. So we need to monitor all data flows in and out of the organization. And then we can develop appropriate policies and controls that mitigate the risk of data loss while still allowing appropriate data use. So not all data movement represents data loss because to do our jobs, we have to be able to move data from one place to another. But we need to understand what is good and bad data movement. And that's done by monitoring the data flows, understanding who's sending what data to where, and then building appropriate controls. So 
we're gaining that visibility and then that can drive the data protection actual enforcement that we put in at a later time. So monitoring that data, that gives us our metrics about how the data is put at risk, where the risky movements of data is. Um, communication to employees is a key step. And, you know, this should be done as far in advance as possible. So step five in my seven steps might be too late in the process. And actually, maybe step one should include communication and control. And then it's a six step plan to a data protection strategy. But as I say, this is not set in stone. You can, you know, use this framework, use it to base your own frameworks on. So part of it is that we need to work with those stakeholders. We need to work with the managers in the organization. We need to work with the end users. We need them all to buy into the plan. You know, the whole point is to protect our company data. If we don't have that data protected, basically everybody could be out of a job. You know, if we get targeted, if we get breached, if we have a ransomware attack, um, if we get fined, you know, millions and millions of dollars, we may not be able to survive as a business. So it is in everybody's best interest to buy into the data protection strategy. And whilst, yes, it may be frustrating at times for our end users, we're not trying to break business processes. We are just trying to protect our data. So the more involved those end users are in our data protection strategy, the less likely we are to have friction when we are protecting our data. So we can, once we understand the data flows, understand our risk profile, we can start by targeting the common risky behaviors. So if we see people are uploading documents to a third party data sharing site that we were unaware of and that is not the sanctioned business one to use, we can re-educate those users to say, you should be using you know, OneDrive and not Dropbox or OneDrive and not WeTransfer. So that's where part of the monitoring the data flows come in. Um, you know, it could be the use of external devices such as USB drives for transferring data. You know, they are small, they are likely to be lost or misplaced. Is there a better way our employees can share and move data? We can understand that again from monitoring the data flows. And as our data protection program matures, we can develop more granular, more fine-tuned controls to mitigate specific risks. Employee empowerment. So again, you know, this relates back to step five, you know, making sure our employees accept the security policies and procedures is critical to a successful data protection program. Um, Again, it comes down to communication, but also letting them know what to do if there's an issue, um, whether it's accidental, you know, I sent an email to the wrong person containing sensitive data. Um, you know, they need to be able to report that information and that it will be treated in a sensitive manner. Um, you know, we also need to train our users. So education um, on the correct way to handle data. So, you know, this includes, you know, things like using the right applications, how they can report those issues as well. And education could be, you know, somebody in, in a room, an instructor led class, online training, periodic emails, anything that can help improve their understanding and the importance of data security um, are all useful techniques for this. And also ultimately, the DLP solution that you choose. Um, you need to choose one that offers advice and guidance as part of its remediation. Um, so coaching the employees, <clears throat> not just blocking for no reason, but giving a reason why um, what the user was doing was actually blocked. <clears throat> and then step seven of my seven step plan or potentially six step plan now, um, actually deploying some form of data protection technology in the organization. And this could be an enterprise DLP solution such as Secure Envoy, Secure Identity, 
This could be leveraging integrated DLP in existing security technologies within your organization. But starting with your most critical data, you know, what's going to cause you the most harm? So this is the first step. And then once you've understood what your critical data is, you can expand that into, you know, a bigger data set um, or maybe, you know, classification of the data so you can fine tune your data controls. Uh, monitoring, you know, that process and fine tuning as you go. And, you know, it's not a, you know, single set of steps. It's not a confined process. It's a continual process. It's a cyclical process. We understand what's critical to us now and we put protection in place in six months time, 12 months time, whatever your reevaluation is or continuously as data changes, as new technologies come around, as our data sharing expands, um, you know, we'll expand that as well. And also, you know, anytime your risk profile changes, if you acquire another company or you move more data to the cloud, you need to reevaluate the risks to the business and then adjust your data protection strategy accordingly. So those are, you know, the seven steps as a framework to data protection. Um, and, you know, it will get you a handle on your data and help you understand the risk to your organization. But data security or DLP is just, you know, one puzzle piece. So what else, you know, are we looking at in terms of, you know, our cyber security strategy? Things like uh, the CIS controls from the Center for Internet Security, um, looking at these as part of your overall cyber defense strategy. These are a prioritized set of safeguards to mitigate the most prevalent cyber attacks against systems and networks. Um, you know, these are mapped to and referenced by multiple legal, regulatory and policy frameworks. And as you can imagine, data does feature in multiple controls, but it also has a dedicated section to itself. So CIS control three is all around data protection. Another um, handy resource in your overall cybersecurity strategy is the MITRE ATT&CK uh, knowledge base. So it's actually uh, a knowledge base of tactics and techniques used by attackers. Uh, so understanding how you may be attacked can actually, um, you know, help us identify those attacks. Uh, and several um, different attacks are talking about, you know, how data is exfiltrated from an organization. So uh, I'll give you an example of a couple. So T1030 talks about transfer size limit. So this could be what we would talk around drip DLP. So an attacker may try to send out small chunks of data. So it could be, you know, I tried to send out 10 credit card numbers, they got blocked. So I tried five and it got blocked. So I tried four and it got allowed. So then 10 minutes later, I sent out another four. And then 10 minutes later, I sent out another four. So drip DLP to actually identify those small, slow leaks of data. 11.052 is physical medium. So, you know, this is USB sticks and hard drives. So, um, you know, could even be a USB CD drive or a floppy disk. So your protection strategy needs to think about these external devices connected to your machines. And finally, some common DLP myths. So we can do some myth busting. Um, DLP will slow our network down. Well, not necessarily really these days our networks have improved in speed um if you were trying to scan the content of every piece of data as it flows through your network there's going to be an overhead however with a correct implementation and a correct uh, technology solution then um, this is not really going to be a problem these days DLP is only for internal networks. Uh, this was probably true 10, 15 years ago when our network, um, you know, was that castle protecting all of our data. And um, you certainly still need to 
obviously monitor and maintain security controls for your internal network. But with the huge shift today in remote working, working from home, uh, cloud storage, we definitely need to actually think about all of those and implementing you know, the seven steps, gaining that data visibility, monitoring those data flows, we can understand where our data is going and who's using it. DLP requires a big bang approach. Um, no, I would say that the best approach to a data security project and data protection is a phased approach following a methodology such as the one that I've discussed today. And this allows you to stage the rollout of any technological solution as well as go through that cyclical iteration on your policies and your deployment to reduce any negative business impact. So, as I said, we're not trying to stop business processes from happening. We're trying to protect our most critical assets, which is our data. But if you concentrate on the most critical data first, then you can expand it and you can cover more and more data. So, Thank you for your time today. That's the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, we'll have a look at the Q&A panel to see if there's any questions come through. Otherwise, feel free to reach out to either ourselves at Secure Envoy or Aramel and his colleagues at Bulwark, and we can have further discussions on how we can help your data protection strategy. I think there is a query on the chat uh, regarding the deployment option. Yeah, yeah. So what are the types of DLP deployment for Secure Envoy? So there's, there's two portions to the answer to this question. One is that our DLP solution can be deployed wherever you want it to be deployed. So we offer it as an on-premise um, DLP deployment that can still protect your devices wherever they are. It can be deployed into public or private cloud. So you can have it in Azure, you can have it in AWS, you can have it in GCP. So that's the, you know, management side of the solution. And then we have the various enforcement points depending on the requirement. So we have endpoint DLP, so that's an endpoint agent um, deployed to your machines. So that's Windows, Mac, and Linux machines to actually protect those devices wherever they are. We then have the ability to do data at rest discovery for bio servers, uh, databases, cloud services. Um, and, and again, that can be deployed wherever it needs to be in the organization. So really flexible on what a deployment looks like. And then finally, um, network-based DLP. So if you're looking to protect, you know, network level traffic in a network or even cloud-based email from, you know, G Suite or um, Office 365, for example, then those are all options. How is it licensed? Um, yeah, so endpoint DLP is licensed per user or per device, really, per endpoint that you're going to deploy. Um, things like file share scanning, um, file server um, protection, cloud account scanning are licensed per service that you want to scan. Um, so if you wanted to scan file shares and databases, then, you know, that's two um scanning targets for that um can secure envoy protect office 365 yeah so um we can do that data at rest scanning to understand what is in your office 365 from an endpoint point of view we can protect data um you know going off to any service, whether it's Office 365, Google, WeTransfer, Teams messages, uh, anything like that. So we can protect that. Um, great question, Harry, about classification. So within our endpoint DLP solution, we provide 
a classification tool that integrates with the Microsoft Office Suite and Microsoft Outlook and allows you to classify documents manually or automatically and classify emails and have various rules regarding that classification. And the great news is that that's included with the endpoint license at no additional cost. Great questions. Um, okay, so how do you compare with Forcepoint? Um, another great question. One of the unique features about the Secure Envoy DLP solution is that we include OCR at the endpoint, so scanning of images at the endpoint, and that's done locally with no requirement for an OCR server to be deployed. So that's um, you know something that's different. Additionally, coming back to the classification, we include classification built into the solution without the need to integrate with a third party solution. Um, the ease of deployment for the solution, I can get a DLP system for endpoints up and running in under an hour with some basic policies. Any sort of deployment ultimately is going to take, you know, several days of professional services to get all of the policies um, deployed and tuned. So, um, but it is, you know, very straightforward to get going with the solution. For the DLP deployment, what are the systems you need at the back end? Um, so the solution is provided as an all in one solution. So effectively, if you wanted to just deploy our DLP to some endpoints, you would install our central console, which is our central management console. It's a CentOS based Linux server. Everything you need for for it is included in the installer. So it doesn't need any databases on the back end. It includes its own built-in database. It doesn't need a SQL license. It doesn't need a Windows machine license. Um, and then if you were deploying to a Windows device, um, then you would download the agent for the Windows machine from uh, the central console, and then you would deploy it using your traditional um, DLP, uh, sorry, your traditional endpoint deployment software, FCCM, GPO, et cetera. So that looks like it's about it for the questions at the moment. As I say, if you've got any other questions, feel free to reach out to Secure Envoy or Bulwark and we'll be happy to answer those. Thanks, man. It was a wonderful uh, session. It was detailed about uh, the complete idea about the DLP and uh, the data leakage prevention on the uh, sensitive data for any kind of an organization. And uh, I believe it was a couple of questions and you already answered that. And if, if anyone, anyone have any kind of you know, more questions that you came across in your mind, please feel free to contact us. You can always contact us at aromal at bulwark.biz in my email ID. Um, my access is also, also available in my, you know, signature and, and other, uh, you know, kind of meetings. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the, in the chatting, like this video will be completely recorded and you will send a, a link that will be uploaded in the our YouTube channel. So you can always refer for your future endeavors. And uh, we believe that there will be a lot of inquiries comes from the, uh, your valuable uh, customers that are looking for the uh, data leakage prevention, and uh, you can always consider uh, why will be the right solution in this moment. And uh, once again, I thank you all the uh, 
different uh, partner communities and other people who joined for the session and uh, make it happen as a successful one. Thanks again, and thanks, Ben. Thanks, uh, the complete team uh, who has joined for this and uh, it's for a wonderful session. Thanks again. Have a nice day.